it's so great to see you all. In case we haven't met, maybe you've gotten a newsletter from me or something like that. Uh, my name is Tim Kenny. It's nice to see all of you here. And welcome to our two-day Master Gardener Conference. Let's see where to begin. Let's start with some gratitude. Who is here from the conference planning committee? Who's in the room? Please stand up. We're really looking forward to what you have planned. This is a, looks like a great lineup. Two days of learning, inspiration, and connecting with each other. It's hard to believe the last time we gathered for an annual conference, it's been three years. And a few things have happened <laughs> since we last gathered together. Oh, some things like, oh gosh. Um, we've made some great strides though during that time. Things like, well, we navigated an unexpected storm, didn't we? Mm -hmm. With the pandemic. We reinvented in person, distance to distance and solo activities. Do you remember that? Do you remember filling out an exemption form? Uh oh, yeah, exactly, right? It feels like a long time ago. And we're continuing, we're continuing in our work. We're building back some of the tried and true things we used to do. We're keeping some of the reinventions that worked well, and we're creating some new and different things in our communities. Plus we developed a five-year strategic plan for our program. Thank you very much for your input on that along the way. And congratulations, kudos, and hooray to all of you. I'm really looking forward to continuing to work together on our program's garden path forward. I know there will be, there'll be new potholes, new, there'll be new weeds, there'll be some new invasive species, but there's also going to be some wonderful celebrations and some fantastic community impacts because I know we made it through the last three years together. I know we're going to keep going together. And in doing that, we'll continue to make our shared Minnesota landscapes healthier for people, plants, and the planet. A big kudos to all of you. Hey, Andrew. Hey. I am so excited to get to introduce someone new to you, new to the Arboretum, new to me, new to all of us. This is Andrew Gapinski. He's a new director of the Arboretum. And some words from you, Andrew. in the back he's in charge of uh it he's doing a great job i turned it off eric sorry so welcome to the arboretum and i typically would ask how many people have been here before but i'm guessing <laughs> everybody has but why don't i say how many people haven't been here before how many people this is your first time to the arboretum look at that maybe like five well i've only been here let's round of applause for the people that are first time Well, welcome and welcome to everyone. So yesterday represented my one month anniversary. <laughs> and I, I had uh, my 30 day review with my, my new boss, the Dean of C fans. I'm still standing, so I think I'm doing okay. I got, I arrived May 1st and it was uh, kind of the heat of spring here. We had uh, 140,000 tulip bulbs uh, popping up. There was still ice on, uh, on the lakes, uh, but the tulips were working their way out of the ground. And so I got to see that full display, 160 varieties of tulips come up. 
Of course, the lilacs, which are still in bloom today. And yesterday I was out and about driving on Three Mile Drive and, and stopped into the uh, Azalea Trial Gardens uh, and was just blown away. I've never seen anything like it in, in my career. So as you explore the grounds today, please get out to the azaleas and the peonies are starting uh, to bloom as well. So there's some can't miss moments that are in the landscape. Uh, and uh, you'll probably see me out there again if you're if, as well. So I wanted to tell you a little bit my, about my background uh, in horticulture, just to give an introduction. So everyone take a deep breath. I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> right? And who's from Wisconsin in the room? Anybody originally? <laughs> I think we would all agree, all the Wisconsinites in the room would agree that we live in Minnesota because Minnesota is just a little bit better. Right? And I'm sticking to that story until I'm back in Wisconsin, yep. So I was born and raised in Wisconsin. I attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison for horticulture with a business uh, minor. And uh, after that, I went to the Morton Arboretum uh, as an intern and then became a horticulturist. And I fell in love with the idea of working within public gardens the ability to connect with plants, people, conservation, uh, and all the people in this room. Just a great network and community of people that are dedicated to what we do. So after uh, my time at the Morton Arboretum, where I met my wife, who's also a horticulturist, uh, moved to the University of Delaware and studied horticulture at the University of Delaware, and then ended up at Penn State University as the director of horticulture and curator of that emerging public garden. And that was my first real access to the power of university-based uh, institutions. The ability to tap into research, into extension, and to groups of uh, dedicated individuals like yourself. There's no other public garden in the world that isn't affiliated with the university that has that automatic network and connections um, to all of those resources. After Penn State, I went to Harvard University, was stepping out of land grant and an institution that had horticulture at its core, which was interesting. And I was director of horticulture at Harvard's Arboretum for 10 years. And so reflecting on that journey, when the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum position came open, it was one, a, a, an opportunity for myself and my family, my wife's from Chicago, to bring two kids back to the Midwest uh, and be closer to the family. But it was also an opportunity for my wife and I to return to our roots at a university that's still thriving within horticulture. And when we talk about uh, the highlights of this institution, tulips and gardens and buildings are outstanding here. But what really is the hallmark of this institution is when partnerships are involved. So we think about the Horticulture Research Center that's across the street. Who has ever eaten a Honeycrisp apple? Okay. The fact that we can say that that was developed here at the Arboretum with a partnership at CFANS and the faculty, or the azalea introductions that we just talked about, or the, the wine tasting that you're going to do later tonight. Oh, what? <laughs> oh, you, you didn't tell that to <laughs> All of those are possible through partnership. And then when you start exploring deeper into what partnerships exist at the Arboretum and why it is today, you look at our natural resources and the lakes and meadows and prairies. Spring Creeper Meadow was a partnership with faculty from fisheries and wildlife and natural biological conservation. Right? And then when you think about the Arboretum and the network of individuals that are in this room through the Extension and Master Gardener program, it's an endless, endless opportunity to engage uh, and change the world. And we need that because the world has a lot of challenges with global change and climate change. We need to be thinking differently about how we cultivate our landscapes and natural environments and our home gardens and the Arboretum. Um, and so it has never been more important for you all to be in this room to be talking about what the future of the Master Gardener program is 
because it's needed more than ever before. So I congratulate you for being part of this program and I thank you for your dedication to it. And I look forward to, as the new executive director here, engaging with the program and helping to achieve all the goals that you set out to do. So again, thank you for being here and uh, we're honored to host you once again. Tim says that this will never be hosted at any other place other than the Arboretum. <laughs> um, but enjoy yourselves here. The Arboretum uh, is open till 8 p.m. and there's the three mile drive or walk uh, and explore as much as you can. And, uh, but good luck and uh, have a great meeting. Thank you, Andrew. Can you tell why I'm pretty excited for, for a new director? This is gonna be great. Welcome, Andrew, to you as well. Let's see, Carrie, I think you're up next, right? Let's get on with our learning and on with our keynote speaker. You've met Carrie, perhaps. I know it's been a few years. <laughs> Carrie, thank you for all your work on this conference and over to you. Absolutely, thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Another round for our fearless leader. You know, this is one of my favorite moments of the year. It kind of launches summer, having um, the opportunity to look back and see all of your faces. Thank you for making the trip to the Arboretum today. I'm Carrie Stowers. I have the honor to work at the Arboretum uh, with Tim Kenny and the adult ed team. Uh, I want to shout out to Jill Lene and Maria Klein and Eric Crowell. And thank you again, Andrew, for popping in today. I know you're busy, but um, we just have a wonderful place to work. How lucky are we, right? Um, and Tim is absolutely right um, that this is a really monumental today that we were able to, to join back in person again. And uh, he mentioned the committee, and I just want to say thank you again to the folks in here um, that spend their time all year thinking and um, collaborating and working and meeting uh, with our team to bring this together. So uh, the folks on the screen, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without you. And it's my pleasure to, to give you some housekeeping uh, rules and updates. And uh, no, there are no rules, I guess. <laughs> but the restrooms we know are on the other both sides of the auditorium. And um, the gift store is open today. Please visit them and with your badge, you get a 10% discount. Uh, there will be a book signing after the keynote today and tomorrow where you can um, visit our lovely speakers. And uh, we have given everybody a uh, folder. You should have received a folder, folder when you came into registration and it has the agenda. Uh, for today and tomorrow. Um, and in the inside, there is a half sheet. And if you've been to our conferences before, you know we use Pigeonhole. Uh, it's an online platform that allows us to ask questions. And then you can go on and vote for your favorites. Uh, and that's how the Q&A will be handled this afternoon. Um, and then also in the folder, we have a uh, bioabstract packet that has all of the information, background information of our lovely speakers who are joining us this weekend. We're really excited to bring together some, you know, uh, unique uh, perspectives, some new voices, and uh, some updates. Uh, Lon Teleguins will be up here um, this afternoon to hear from Dan Shaw about what's going on with that. And uh, Julie Weisenhorn will be over in the Snyder. Um, Alan Branhagen will be in here uh, tomorrow. And then obviously we have stuff going on up at the new farm at the Arb as well. So a lot going on. I hope you really enjoy yourselves. And thank you for making my day for making the trek here. It really means a lot. Um, speaking of making the trek here, um, our keynote speaker for the day, she doesn't know it, but she's been on uh, our minds and the committee for probably over four years, wouldn't you say, Melinda? We started talking about this idea that we could bring a world-renowned, award-winning poet and cultural worker, someone who's making an inroad in the work that she does, the voice she has um, to share with us. And so I'd like to welcome our speaker, Sun Young Shin, up. And we are so lucky that not only she joins us today, she's in our backyard, um, but we are gonna um, just be able to uh, learn from her and hopefully take away some new ideas, new thoughts, new feelings, and then there'll be a Q&A afterwards. So thank you for coming. Afternoon, everyone. Four years 
that's no pressure on me whatsoever. <laughs> that's fine. That's great. Um, and thank you so much, Melinda, and Carrie, and Tim, and Maria, and everyone. And you know, so now we have someone to blame. If the talk doesn't go well, it's really on Melinda, <laughs> well, little librarian and master gardener. Um, thank you so much. I'm really excited. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. My name's Sun Young, and I was asked to talk about creating connections in the community through gardens, breaking barriers through plants, which I really love. So I have to warn you, I'm a little bit of a slide maximalist. So, and I'm a poet, it's gonna be a little associative, but um, I've got some stories, I've got some images, I've got some history, I've got some questions for you. Um, I've got some poetry to share of other people. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a, a lively discussion at the end. So thank you so much. So I'm a Korean American immigrant and Minnesota author who writes at the intersections of community, culture, and nature. I have this little strawberry here because that's one of the things that I helped my mother with in the garden when I was little. And I do not have any Wisconsin jokes, but I grew up in Illinois. So we are, of course, Wisconsin adjacent. And, you know, I have feelings about that. Um, <laughs> But my mom lives in rural Illinois in, in a township called Thompson, Illinois, across from Clinton, Iowa. She's really, I don't know if she would qualify as a master gardener, but that's, I think she would. She's been a gardener her whole life. Her mother was a gardener. Um, so I really am, am um, here at their, with their wisdom. Okay. So I thought I would start with a poem by Joy Harjo, our most recent but not current poet laureate of the United States. This is from her book, How We Became Human, New and Selected Poems, 1975 to 2001. So this is a poem called In Praise of Earth. In Praise of Earth by Joy Harjo. We kept on dancing last summer, though the dancing had been called subversive. We weren't alone at the end of this particular world and knew it wouldn't be the last world. The wars had broken out on all sides. We kept on dancing and with us were the insects who had gathered at the grounds in the grasses and the trees. And with us were the stars and a few lone planets who had been friends with the earth for generations. With us were the spirits who wished to honor this beloved earth in any beautiful manner. And with us at dawn was the sun who took the lead, and then we broke for camp, for stickball and breakfast. We all needed praise made of the heart's tattoo as it inspired our feet or wings, someone to admire us despite our tendency to war, to terrible stumbles. So does the red cliff who is the heart broken to the sky. So do the stones who were the first to speak when we arrived. So does the flaming mountain who harbors the garden spirits who refuse to abandon us. And this earth keeps faithfully to her journey, carrying us around the sun. All of us in our rags and riches, our rages and promises, small talk and suffering. As we go to the store to buy our food and forget to plant, sing so that we will be nourished in turn. As we walk out into the dawn, with our lists of desires that her gifts will fulfill. As she turns our tears into rivers of sweet water, we spiral between dusking and dawn, wake up and sleep in this lush palace of creation, rooted by blood, dreams, and history. We are linked by leaf, fin, and root. When we climb through the sky to each new day, our thoughts are clouds shifting weather within us. When we step out of our minds into ceremonial language, we are humbled and amazed at the sacrifice. Those who forget become the people of stone who guard the entrance to remembering. And the earth keeps up her dancing, and she is neither perfect nor exactly in time. She is one of us, and she loves the dance for what it is. So does the sun who calls the earth beloved, 
and praises her with light. So thank you, Joy Harjo. I'm going to bring another writer, a local writer's words into the space with this book, um, What We Hunger For, Refugee and Immigrant Stories About Food and Family. And this is the local writer, Janata Petrus Nasa. And her piece is the last in the book, and it's titled Lake Superior Looks Like the Ocean to Island Girls from Minnesota. <laughs> One, ginger, lemon, honey, fresh thyme, orange peel, parsley, cilantro, cumin, sea salt, cracked pepper, curry, lime, sugar. Medicine is culinary, culinary is medicinal. I'm gonna to skip to three and then go back to two and then I'll start my slide avalanche. Okay, so three. In the summers, my mom raised us kids gardening like her grandfather taught her in Trinidad. My sisters hated it, but I loved it, especially weeding, picking all, the, all of the useless to us green sprigs that would make way for a delicious earthy blackness, the color of crumbled Oreos. There are women who chew on dirt of red, black, and brown varieties, searching with tongue and mouth for the nutrients in the soil their bodies need. I loved the sweat and heat of being in our yard, nurturing and yielding soil and seed into food and herb. Medicine is culinary and culinary is medicinal. In gardens, you feel the healing and the pleasure in herbs. My mom took pleasure in the nuanced perfection of a self-grown ingredient, how they tasted different than store-bought. So back to two. So this book um, was being finalized in 2020 and uh, went, to, went to the printer in maybe October or November of 2020. And my writers were writing in 2019 and in through 2020 and into the summer of 2020 and came out in 2021 from the Minnesota Historical Society. So two by Janata Petrus Nasa. This year I didn't grow a garden. Somehow I couldn't plant or nurture a thing beyond myself, and I did that barely. This year, my soul, body, and mind were a garden, and all I had it in me to nurture. This summer kind of was weird from the jump. Even though I felt the warmth coming in through the cracks of the pandemic, I was afraid to leave my home. We'd been home too much, too long. It was hard to imagine life before all of the captivity. The first time I left my house to go anywhere besides the co-op or Target or a wistful walk around the neighborhood was the evening George Floyd was murdered. It happened a couple of blocks from my house in front of a corner store that had called the cops on him, one that I had frequented to get rolling papers or coconut water. My homegirl Andrea had ridden her bike by my house on the way to check it out and I decided to roll too. That night I came home and sat on the couch and watched the city outside of my doors on CNN while simultaneously hearing helicopters, police sirens, cars speeding, chanting, and loud pops, an uprising all around me. I am not sure if that is why I didn't garden and certainly could barely write. Every day was a hurricane of emotion, and every day was filled with organizing and meeting and doing work to keep my community healthy and sane. I was doing revolutionary work, but in ways that felt far away from myself, from my altar, the dirt. I was manic and depressed. I creeped into myself through dancing and kundalini yoga and sitting in the sun too, and staring out the window. As I write this, I feel a disappointment in myself. I wish I had it in me to grow food, to eat in the middle of a pandemic and an uprising. I feel like I should be growing and canning, like some of my revolutionary homies and my ancestors, those versed in food systems and urban gardening. People who, like me, are suspicious of government. I know you shouldn't should on yourself, but how did they avoid being a puddle on the ground of life? And for long enough to do something so hopeful and sensible as plant a seed when the soil is ready. So instead, I insist that I gardened me this year. I planted and harvested little revolutions that live within myself and my ancestral memory. So that's Janata's piece in there. 
So thank you for sharing that time with me. So I did bring some, just as a, as a friend uh, for us, some sweet grass that my friend, the poet Hyde Erdrich just brought me last uh, Saturday. It smells amazing. Um, and I've just got some quotes. In some native languages, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us by Robin Wall Kimmerer. <clears throat> so I believe in the holy and magic work of naming. I am a word worker, a mother, a gardener. My mother was a gardener and her mother was a gardener. And the rose is for my, my grandmother, um, who always, one of my important jobs was watering the roses, which was really like, just get out of the house and out of my <laughs> hair and leave me alone. You know, yes, the, wa the roses need watering for hours. Um, <laughs> But it was really, um, I mean, that was just, that's one of my blessed early memories of spending time in her garden. So through words, through community, through listening, and through human, that is to say, natural work, I aim to do healing work with others. <clears throat> because of human choices and impact, ecosystems that support all life are in trouble, as you know, we're in trouble, our children, our grandchildren are, are facing trouble. So Robin again says, philosophers call this state of isolation and disconnection species loneliness, a deep unnamed sadness stemming from estrangement from the rest of creation, from the loss of relationship. As our human dominance of the world has grown, we have become more isolated, more lonely when we can no longer call out to our neighbors. It's no wonder that naming was the first job the creator gave Nana Bojo. So I, one of the things I did during the pandemic, um, the first two years of the pandemic, was take an online permaculture class for women. Um, and so I'm sure many, many, if not all of you are familiar with permaculture design principles and probably have many interesting thoughts and or critiques. Um, but one of the things that I have used a lot in my, also in my other work as um, kind of an equity trainer, consultant with arts and community organizations, and in thinking through how I do my work in general is principle number 11 which is use edges and value the marginal. So my perspective as a writer and as a person, as an immigrant, as a Korean American um, here in the US as a naturalized citizen really comes from the edges and the margins. So when I came across that principle in the class and in the reading, I was really struck by how that resonated with me and in thinking about how um, classrooms, organizations, societies, neighborhoods, families, I mean, that how, how we could really shift a lot of our paradigms and a lot of our, our relationships if we had more of a focus on the edges and the margins as a society. And so this is a landscape painting, a traditional landscape painting with Korean red pines, which I'm gonna to touch on for a moment. So traditionally, Koreans believe everything has a spirit, that everything is connected. It's called animism in you know, Latin, in English, anima meaning the soul. Um, my friend and co-author Diane Wilson, who is in, um, I met through working on my book, A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota. Um, she is the person who I talk about in the introduction of this book. Um, as a food sovereignty activist. And then my latest book is co-written with Diane and I'm gonna share some pages with that, of that with you. So whenever we give a talk together, she gives a talk, she starts with how mitaku yapi, which means hello, all my relatives. So in my work, I try to write toward life and flourishing and against tyranny and domination. I do not always succeed, um, but also as a teacher and as a, as a worker. So I'm just gonna go really quick through some of my books and some of the work that I do in communities just to give you a little bit more of a sense of what this is all about. 
um, these intersections of culture and nature and um, community. These are my poetry books. So I've lived here since 1992. I came after my first year of college in Boston to McAllister College and finished there. And then like, like many people who come to Minnesota, never leave. Um, I'm still here and, and grateful. Um, so these are other anthologies that my work is in. This book is really wonderful, We Are Meant to Rise, co-edited by Carolyn Holbrook and David Mura, um, Voices for Justice from Minneapolis in the World, which came out in 2021. Oh my gosh, is it my broker? Buy, sell. Like, what's, what are we doing? What are we doing here? Okay, um, my picture books for children and the Minnesota organizations for whom I've written or with whom I've worked as an artist and educator. Um, all of those people have been um, I was going to say like scarred by my coming to visit them, but that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. But I often also, also explain to people in Minnesota, I was raised in a suburb of Chicago by like hardcore Southside Chicago people. I, I'm, I'm very direct for a Minnesotan. And if it feels like I don't have any manners, I just want to place it on like Illinois. I've tried, I've tried to become like a good Minnesotan 30 years. Uh, it's a work in progress. Um, but my newest book, Where We Come From, is, is really based in, based in nature and long time, big time um, in the cosmos, where we come from. So it's me, Diane Wilson, Shannon Gibney, John Coy, and illustrated by Dion MBD. What age is it? It's for like um, ages two to eight. Yeah, thank you. Um, so picture book uh, by Learner Publishing. So this, I'll just read the first few pages and I'll skip to a couple um, other ones that, that are placed in Korea. The first, it opens, we come from stardust, our bodies made of ancient elements. So we know that, you know, we're in a time of book banning, um, thanks to all our librarians and school teachers. And I taught public high school for 13 years, uh, our booksellers who are fighting against book banning and, and uh, limiting what, what young people have access to. One of those things, of course, is science and evolution, right? We're in struggles in this country, in, especially in certain places um, around science principles, right? We come from single cells evolving over billions of years, as did all life on Earth, bacteria, trees, animals. We really wanted to have like a whole section on bacteria. <laughs> Our editor said wisely, well, let's just move on to, you know, okay. But we were, especially Shannon and me, were really geeking out about bacteria. Um, in time, we became humans who spread out around the world. We come from place, language, and spirit and each of us comes from story. So this is Diane's first pages. I come from Minnesota Makoche, a land of forests and clear lakes where cornfields remember a vast prairie, a sea of tall grass home to bison, burrowing owls, and Dakota skipper butterflies. <clears throat> one of my pages. I come from Korea, green mountains, black rocks, and cold springs, wet moss, giant frogs, and pine trees winding around shadows. I come from over 100 years of migration across the Pacific, first on the SS Gaelic. So that um, was the first ship that brought Korean laborers to Hawaii, um, to the United States for the first time to sugarcane plantations and pineapple farms in Hawaii. So that's just an excerpt from the book. So plants, of course, we know are powerful. That's why we're here. There are oxygen, our medicine, symbols, food, life. This is um, uh, obviously space 
view of the Korean Peninsula where I was born. And, and one of the things that I like to do when I talk about my homeland, and I talk about Korea, is to show, to show the land without the political boundaries um, and show the country as it was um, before partition in 1953. Okay, so a little plant story. So this is sook or mugwort, Korean mugwort. And I have a big, uh, really big, it grows like, um, there's no tomorrow. It's very, it's, uh, there's a huge patch in my backyard that I'm gonna have to thin down. Um, so this is the origin myth of Korea and it's plant-based, right? So Hwanong spent his time looking down upon the earth from heaven. So he's the prince of heaven. He went to his father Hwanin to ask permission to live among the humans of earth. Hwanin, as Lord of the Heavens, granted his son permission to descend to earth, and he bestowed three heavenly seals upon his son before his departure. The three seals were a bell, a mirror, and a sword, all of which represented advice from Hwanin to his son. Hwanong also took 3,000 followers with him when he descended to earth. Among those were the spirits of rain, wind, and clouds. Upon his arrival to Earth, Huanong settled on Bektu Mountain or Bektu San and established Xinxi, the city of God, which is an actual, so it's an active volcano, a stratovolcano on the Chinese North Korean border. It's the highest mountain in North Korea. He adjusted to life on Earth and established a government for the people, created a code of law, and gave the humans knowledge of fields such as medicine, agriculture, and arts. And these are some beautiful um, rice fields, paddies, terraced rice paddies in, in Korea. One day he was approached by a tiger and a bear who pleaded with him to help them become humans. And so this resonates too with, with Joy Harjo's book, How We Became Human. Hwanong agreed, but only if they could complete the challenge he set before them. Hwanong instructed the tiger and bear to live inside a dark cave together for 100 days, eating nothing but garlic and mugwort. If they could survive these 100 days with nothing else to sustain them, Hwanong would make them human. The tiger and bear entered the cave and tried to live off the herbs and garlic. However, the tiger could not last and left the cave after only 20 days. The bear remained inside the cave, consistently holding on to her wish to become human. It seems very misguided, like just stay being the bear, but this was the story. Um, you know, that's our, that's our perspective now, yes. So the bear persevered for the entire 100 days after which she was transformed into a human female. Hwanong then named the female Ungyo, which is derived from the Sino-Korean characters that mean bear woman. Upon becoming human, she wished for a child but had no husband. She prayed, asking for a child, and eventually Huanang married her himself. So together they brought forth Dangun, a son, who eventually became the ruler of the land and is credited with the founding of Old Chosun, which dates back to 233 BC and is considered the first kingdom of Korea. So if you've ever heard of the Korean name that Koreans call their country, it's Chosun, and that's where this is from. Um, so the moral of the story to me um, is plants are medicine and that patience brings desired transformation. <clears throat> so a little bit about shamanism and animism, the indigenous belief systems in Korea. Shamanism is the belief that human beings can interact with any god or spirit, not just those found in animism, but also ancestors or deified heroes from the past. Animism is based on the notion that inert objects such as mountains, trees, wind, and rain are inhabited by spirits that human beings can interact with. A little bit about prehistoric Korea it was inhabited from 10,000 BCE or even earlier by people who subsisted on hunting, fishing, and gathering. 
The earliest known settlements date to 6000 BCE. Then this is a uh, picture of a dolmen, which is a grave um, guardian structure, construction for aristocrats. And there's tens of thousands, there's hundreds of thousands of these uh, all over Korea. Agriculture was first practiced from the second millennium BCE, overlapping with the Bronze Age. Okay, a little bit about rice. So rice cultivation came from China, probably second millennium BCE. And then rice is so important that when you ask when you meet someone, you ask them, have you eaten rice? As a way of just saying, have you eaten? Are you well? How are you, right? Um, it actually became popularized as a phrase in the 60s when hunger was a significant problem after the Civil War. So it shows concern for someone's well-being. And that's something that, you know, is a consistent motif throughout the stories in this book of refugee and immigrant food stories of Minnesota writers that, that um, their immigrant parents, their refugee parents, didn't say, I love you. They didn't <clears throat> show affection in the same way a lot of Western families do or can do, but the love was shown through food. So a little bit about the red pine. Trees are our elders, resilient and enduring. So it's another traditional painting with the red pine and then the red crowned crane, which is, um, an important bird in, in Korea. So here's a, a photo of a Korean red pine. It's widely considered the national tree of Korea. Korea also has a national uh, flower, the Rose of Sharon. And it's so important that it's, it's in the national anthem as the pine tree atop Namsan, which is Mount Nam, stands firm, unchanged through wind and frost as if wrapped in armor, so shall our resilient spirit. So traditionally, the Korean whoops, should say red pine is one of the 10 symbols of longevity, the other being the sun, mountains, water, clouds, rocks, mushrooms of immortality. I was like, wait, let me put a pin in that and get <laughs> back to that. What? <laughs> mushrooms of immortality. Um, no one told me about this. White cranes, deer, and turtles. And the red pine appears frequently in traditional art and um, literature. So can our love for plants bring us together? Um, you know, my homeland is divided. What are the rights of nature? What are the rights of children and the innocent? What are the rights of animals to cross borders? Korea has been in an ongoing civil war since 1950 and millions of people are separated because of the border. Um, many have died since 1953, never knowing what happened to their family who were trapped um, above the 38th parallel. I've been back to South Korea five times and I've been to the DMZ twice. It's really uh, a fascinating, tragic place for a lot of reasons. It's only two and a half miles wide and 160 miles long. So you may have read or heard, or, or maybe you've been there, that the DMZ has become this nature preserve, unintentional ecological treasure trove, but there's over a million landmines buried in the soil. So people cannot cross through, even if they could, you know, politically, um, because of the landmines, it's impossible um, until those are, and if they are removed. So here's an image of part of the border. Here's a map of the border and then there's the civilian control zone kind of on both either side where a lot of rice farming takes place, especially on the north. And I was born in Seoul, which is close to this line. And so just for a little geography, the 45th parallel runs through Minnesota. So we're As one of the world's most pristine nature preserves, while it's fortified with tall barbed wire fences, riddled with landmines and heavily guarded, um, plants and wildlife were able to grow unrestrained, much like in the way during 
the two first two years of the pandemic, um, the air got cleaner, certain places, animals and plants began to return. And now that's being, you know, that's been reversed as uh, the effects have been reversed as we've come back to the way society was before in many ways. And of course, we know that with climate change and climate pressure, many species are, will not be able to migrate through many of these solid border walls that um, are around the world now. So that's another image from inside the DMZ. The plants in the DMZ are also extraordinary. It's one giant living museum of plants, home to 517 endemic species and 550 rare, rare species. <clears throat> So this is an image of this beautiful Korean mountain burnet. And there's also um, extensive wetlands and a unique ecosystem. So let's skip over that. Um, birds. So just some images from uh, National Geographic from inside the DMZ, the red crowned uh, cranes, and then those are dry rice fields on either side. Wetland bog pictures. Um, it's the only high moor in South Korea. Summer floods bring um, water to the swampy areas of the DMZ. And the water drains into the Bukhan River, which eventually empties into the Yellow Sea. All right, so born in Korea, raised in Illinois, and then here in Minnesota, a Dakota place, uh, Dakota place since time immemorial is what the people say. So just wanna uh, give us the opportunity to think a little bit about where we are, um, how we're here on the land, what it means, what, what our obligations and opportunities are. Um, and so this book I brought also, the oral traditions of the Dakota people say that the Dakota originated in Minnesota. Our spirits came from the creator down the Kansu Wagnagi, the spirit road, more commonly known as the Milky Way. According to the book, Minnesota Makoche, the land of the Dakota, authored by Gwen Westerman, who's Minnesota's poet laureate right now, Dakota person, and Bruce White, a non-Dakota person. Rock carving at the Jeffers Petroglyph site in southwestern Minnesota, one of the most extensive petroglyph sites in the world. And so here's um, just a little map of gla the glaciers, Glacial Lake, Duluth. 11 sovereign indigenous nations in Minnesota. A watercolor painting by Seth Eastman from the Minnesota Historical Society Collections, Dakota Summer Lodge, 1846 to 1848. Um, this is 10 years about before Minnesota statehood. Okay. So Europeans and their descendants came to this area for the animals, the timber from the trees, the land upon which to live and farm plants or crops, raise livestock, the water and the minerals. What is the story of plants told by the Minnesota government? Okay, does anyone know what the next slide is gonna be? Do we have any just seers, any clairvoyance? It's just... The what? A lady slipper. A lady slipper. Oh, that's a good. That's a good answer. The orchid. These are all good answers, but incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> you can take an English teacher out of the classroom, but um, it's the Great Seal of the state of Minnesota, which I use in a lot of talks, and and you know we don't have a lot of time to dig into it, but. So 1858 statehood, Lake Twal du Nord, but just take a moment and look at the narrative 
in this symbol. Um, <coughs> And what are the plants in the symbol, in this portrait? What time of year does it seem to be? What time of day is it? Who is in the image? What seems to be their gender? Who is not in the image? What are the people doing? What direction are they going? Um, it's a little bit blurry, but you know, this is a rifle, powder horn, ax, a cut tree. Uh, the farmer doesn't have shoes. The farmer has his own, is pushing his own implement. Um, so there's a lot going on here um, about the official story that Minnesota tells about plants and people and land and who deserves to be here, whose land it is and what the land is for. So what land do I live upon? What earth, which plants give me life? What do I give back to the land? How do I care for the water, which is life? If I, you know, if I thought about this water as my relative, as, as important as my mother, as my grandmother, you know, how, how would I act differently, right? Where's my home garden sited? Where do we grow mugwort and yarrow and peonies and raspberries? and not applies, I have apples. <laughs> oh, spelling, okay, proofreading. Um, this beautiful Macintosh apple tree that requires those little bags from Japan to be put on each. I did that last summer and never again. There's, okay, <laughs> these are for the birds and the squirrels. It's all, it's all good. Um, what stories are told and valued about where I live and what stories are not being told, shared, or passed down? You know, and what, can, what can each of us do about that? Okay. So just to, to situate, um, so you know, I'm in the Nokomis, I live in the Nokomis neighborhood um, near the Minnehaha Creek, which is 22 miles long. Which plants are allowed to live and where? Which people are allowed to live and where? Who gets clean air, green space, and fresh, good food? So many of you, I'm sure, know that the Twin Cities have a history of racially discriminatory housing covenants like many other cities around the country. And we have a lot of really great resources here in Minnesota um, and in Minneapolis where I live as well. So. Um, but my house, which was built in 1927, developed by the Tyndale brothers, who did a lot of the housing in South Minneapolis in the 20s and 30s and in St. Louis Park, uh, my house was built with a racial covenant, which says no person or persons other than of the Caucasian race shall be permitted to occupy said premises or any part thereof. Uh, October 17th, 1927. Racial covenants were an alternative to racially restrictive zoning ordinances, which were outlawed in 1917 on the, on the basis of a constitutional grounds. And in an economic system based on private property that we have here in the United States, land is wealth, land is the source of all, all wealth. Although the Supreme Court ruled these covenants unenforceable in 1948, which I think is when my mom was born, and although the passage of the 1968 Fair Housing Act outlawed them, the private property land-based intergenerational wealth that resulted from this racism continues to affect our community's children, families, and individuals. And that's just a garden from um, this marvelous garden in Minnesota, uh, fine gardening website. So what are the terms of belonging here in Minnesota is a question that I ask myself and really have been asking myself since I got here to St. Paul in 1992. And it felt really different to me than Chicago and then Boston and even the suburb where I grew up, Brookfield, Illinois. What do we hunger for here? How do we feed and nourish our bodies, minds, and spirits? A couple quotes, and then I'm at the end of my slides. Ooh, we did so good. Um, this is really why I made my daughters learn to garden. 
says Robin Wall Kimmerer. So they would always have a mother to love them long after I am gone. Thank you so much. So there's a Q&A. But what do I do? Thank you. Was there a... Can anybody hear me? There is a microphone. Oh, oh yeah, no. sorry. Can you see I'm on the job. Yes. All right, can you hear me now? No, no. Can you hear me now? Oh. Oh. No? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so, so glad you're here today. Uh, I will just start saying that my book club read uh, What We Hunger For, and we each got to pick some selections and Thank talk you. about. So um, I'll ask a question later, but I'm going to try and get some of these from Pigeonhole. Now, if you don't have the app, um, it's not an app, but if you didn't, if you didn't do this, you can just raise your hand and, and uh, I'll kind of come around and see if we can get some questions answered. But the first one here is, do you know how deep the bogs are in the DMZ? My goodness, that's the most amazing question. I don't know how deep they are in the DMZ, but I'm going to find out. Okay. Well, can, so can people go into the waterways? No, yeah. no. Um, it's even very difficult to get permission to go into the civilian control area, which is on either side. I had I was with a group that had special access, um, but otherwise, no. On the on the south side, which is um, there's usually about thirty thousand U.S military personnel in South Korea at any time around the multiple bases and many of those are, are situated on the border. Um, but there are tours. It's actually quite the tourist area on the south side. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that question. Um, that is the only question I have in here so far. Oh, there are new questions. Should I assume that larger animals in the DMZ are endangered by the landmines? Yeah, I, that I, I, I know that's a great too. question, but I have not heard of any animals setting off any landmines, which is really interesting. I've been continuing to do reading on this for several years, and I've never heard I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's a great uh, question, though. Are they smarter than us? I mean, or they could, I mean, or they get to yes, places that human beings couldn't walk. Yeah. Like that's a great question. How did they get all the pictures? Are they all from the air? No, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think some are, and then some uh, um, people have gotten access to go in just to the civilian control area, which is, doesn't have mines in it, but then the inner part does. Yeah, it's just two and a half miles wide. It's really quite small in that regard. Yeah. A lot of questions about the oh, DMZ no. here. Does it freeze over? Yeah. Does it freeze over? Yeah. Oh my gosh. 38 parallel. I don't know. How cold is it? I don't think so. No. <laughs> I mean, South Korea semi, it's like subtropical. It does have monsoons, um, but it's typically, you know, 20 to 30 degrees warmer there than it is here any, at any given time. I mean, there's definitely winter, but that's a great question. Yeah. My self-esteem is dropping rapidly as I'm answering these questions. <laughs> I need I will bone up and come back. Um, these are great. The planting zone. The planting oh the yeah, the gardening zone. I don't know, but um, a lot of the same a lot of the same plants that you can grow here, you can I mean that you can grow in South Korea, you can grow in Minnesota. I mean, so like I have a Korean lilac and some other things and like the mugwort. And so uh, you know the war when it's for the shorter growing season here, but where it's 
warm, it's hot and moist here in the summer. So it is a good environment here for some of the native plants, which is really cool. Korean fir, the fir tree, yeah. I've got a little mugo pine that I planted a few summers ago that is growing like a centimeter a year. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's trying really hard. They're slow, but they're, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. <laughs> Uh, okay, so during my last visit to the Incheon area, it seemed like the people garden everywhere. Tubs of white radish, tons of white, white radish gathered mm. in busy meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and how did the relationship of Koreans to the land evolve as, as cities grew? Oh, that's a change? good question. I mean, before... World War II um, and before, well, really before Japan annexed the Korean Empire in 1910, 90% of Korean people were peasants. And it was a feudal system for many centuries. And so people did not have any land rights. They were serfs. Um, the mass of the common people, 90%, were engaged in agriculture for the food for the whole um, empire, the whole country, the whole peninsula. Now Korea does not have, South Korea does not have food sovereignty anymore. Much of its rice comes from California. Um, some of that is because of urbanization and some of that, I mean, a small percentage of that is actually US military occupation. There's, I've visited one former rice farm that was farmed by people in their 70s. They've been farming there for generations and the US military paved it over for a military site. So it's a small example of militarization of the peninsula, but that as well as urbanization has affected the peninsula. But it's, it's, it's also about 90% mountainous. There's not that much arable land. And so that the farming techniques have been very intensive. People grow wherever they can. And so it makes sense to see lots of gardening. People, especially the elders in South Korea and North Korea are very intense mountain climbers. You will see people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s in matching jumpsuits and visors, running up the mountains, um, <laughs> leaving young people in the dust. It's really quite amazing. But that's that peasant, um, that peasant tradition of people going up and down the mountains, carrying water, carrying food. Yeah. And what's your favorite plant to grow? Oh my gosh, my favorite plant. I mean, I think. I think anything that my mother grew makes me feel really happy to grow and makes me feel close to her. She is thankfully still with us. My father isn't, but my mother is. She still continues to garden. Her garden is amazing. I, I thought about just taking pictures, like just posting pictures of her garden, pretending it was my garden and just like just being very impressive. I do have pictures of my garden, but you know, therefore if we get a little bit closer. Um, um, but yeah, any so tomatoes, I mean, we had green beans, we had strawberries, like I said, all kinds of flowers. Um, yeah, so I think, I think it might be tomatoes. And um, mm -hmm. my mom is still really a, a, a avid tomato gardener. Yeah, thank what you. Kind? Oh my gosh, I have to ask her. I mean, <laughs> She's a cherry tomato fanatic. So the counter is always full of, you know, I mean, and zucchinis, squash, cucumbers. She lives on five acres in rural Illinois, right across from a big um, soybean, commercial soybean field, but then also next to a watermelon field. I guess Thompson, Illinois is like the watermelon capital of the United States. Did not know that. Um, yeah, she can grow practically anything there. It's really amazing. Yeah. yeah. What inspired you to start writing poetry? Oh, what a lovely question. Okay. Um, what inspired me was really, it's, was really becoming a mother. And part, it's, it's kind of a circuitous answer, but, um, before that, I didn't, I felt like I didn't necessarily have things to say. I had a lot of things I was thinking about. And even though I don't write about motherhood or, or my children directly, um, part of my story is that I'm an adoptee from South Korea. And so when I had my first child, I really felt like I joined 
humanity in a different way. Since I, I, I grew up without um, any, you know, blood relatives. Um, and so this was not knowing where I came from, you know, um, and that's also where it just comes through all of my writing of this kind of thinking about ancestry and origins and, and not having answers and so looking to nature and looking to the stars and then looking to my own descendants to think about what does it mean to be a good ancestor. And then so poetry I really use to ask questions about language and how we name things and um, what kinds of words we use to describe ourselves and how we, you know, how we treat each other. Yeah, thanks for that question. Maybe one more. One more? One more? Um, yeah. A little change again here, if I can get the. So your poem around the murder and civil unrest after George Floyd's murder really stuck, struck home. Any suggestions about how our work as master gardeners can continue to heal and build connections through gardening? An amazing question. So my next book that's coming out that I'm working on now is about um, Grace Lee Boggs and James Boggs, who were Detroit movement activists, uh, philosophers. Um, Jimmy Boggs was a Chrysler uh, worker for 30 years. Grace Lee Boggs was from Massachusetts and New York, got a PhD in philosophy in the 30s and of course could not as a Chinese American woman become a professor or even get a job anywhere. Um, long story short, they developed something in their later years called Detroit Summer because they realized they could not depend on the federal government or local government to revitalize their communities, that they really had to start very locally. They had to work intergenerationally. They had to ask young people to become volunteers and start gardening in empty lots. So not only to feed themselves, to learn about um, plants and learn about um, how to grow things themselves, but um, so not just for practical self-sufficiency, but to learn intergenerationally to take pride in their community, even if they weren't, you know, homeowners in the way that um, many middle class people are. Um, and so she's got a whole, um, there's a whole, you know, Detroit movement and this organization called Detroit Summer that is specifically around gardening young people and then um, older people working together. And it's, it goes far beyond just the garden. It really builds those relationships that, you know, my friend Diane Wilson and other native people that I learned from focus on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Those are beautiful questions. Thank you for being such a good listener group. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing with this program. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.